Hello everyone and um, welcome to today's webinar about ransomware. I'm going to speak English since we have Ed with us that is not that good at Norwegian yet, but we're working on it. So, <laughs> today we're going to talk about ransomware and um, ransomware isn't something new, is it Ed? Ransomware has been around for quite, quite a time, right? long as we pay computers <laughs> yeah exactly so nothing new about ransomware in itself but it's constantly evolving and uh, we still need to pay a lot of attention to it and uh, we have to adopt our security uh, techniques to keep up so uh, short um, short about me I'm uh, Jeroen I work for data equipment been here for three plus years now I work as a CISO and I'm a strong Zero Trust believer, so I use Zero Trust Solder as my kind of title. And um, I, I say that we all have to remember that successful attacks happen in allow traffic, meaning we have to reduce the attack surface. Uh, focusing on blocking, blocking, denying, denying is a failed uh, strategy. We have to focus on what we allow. And with that, reduce the attack surface to the absolutely minimum. Uh, I live just outside Oslo, uh, married with two kids, and have lots of hobbies. In the winter, we have skiing. In the summer, we have cycling and motorcycling. And yeah, listen to music and concerts and so on and so on. So that's me. Um, did we have some questions here, perhaps? Before we start, we want to ask you some questions here. Has your organization experienced any serious breach or ransomware attacks? Number two, do you segment IoT devices from the rest of your user community? And number three, do you implement internal phishing campaigns to raise awareness? We would like you to read and understand this and answer them because this will give us a, a baseline on what audience we have today and how we should uh, communicate with you. So we'll give it a few seconds more. Um, any introduction you would like to do, Ed? Uh, yep, I'm Ed Kohler. I work with Extreme Networks. I am a uh, cybersecurity architect here uh, in the company. My job is threefold. Um, the first one is external facing, doing events like this with both partners and directly working with customers. But then also, uh, I'm also involved uh, in the internal uh, product design, uh, making sure our code uh, and our architectural approaches are secure. And then the third thing I do is I provide uh, advice to our own CISO in internal uh, InfoSec and PCERT teams. So. Cool, cool. So I think the poll is done. People have had time to answer and I can uh, present it. I can share the result and we'll see the result here now, Ed. Has your okay. organization experienced a serious breach or ransomware attack? Yes, 41% says yes. 41% says no, that's good. Yeah. And 80% yeah. says, I don't know. Number two, do you segment IoT devices? Yes, 65% says yes, good. 24% says no, Ed, look at that. So something yeah. to do here. Yep. And uh, do you implement internal phishing campaigns to raise awareness? Uh, I guess it should have been an ad I don't know here as well, but there is only a yes and no. 65% uh, says yes, so that's very good. And 35% yeah. uh, says no, so also something to take into con consideration there. So Those are good good results. I'm glad to see that, uh, particularly the IoT segmentation. That, that's good practice, folks. Exactly. And that's one of the advices I'm going to be making. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Then let's... I'll stop my presentation and you can uh, take it from there. Absolutely, sir. Thank you, Goran. Thank you. So folks, um, I've actually done this presentation uh, in the past uh, in modified form. Uh, so what I've done is I, I gradually updated, but uh, I actually first presented this at the Southern California Security Conference uh, late last year. Uh, so it's been updated to kind of talk about 2020 and some of the trends that we're seeing here. Uh, the agenda is going to be fairly straightforward. Uh, we're just going to do a quick review of 2019. 
then we're going to do a quick review of what ransomware is. I'm sure those of you that have experienced an attack are well aware of what it is, but actually it, it, it actually has some surprising forms. We want to understand what those are. And then we want to kind of look forward to uh, what we can expect in 2020. Uh, and then we want to go through and, and start talking about how we can finally get a handle on this uh, after we look at these facts and findings. So 2019 review, uh, as you can see, it, it's, it's fairly varied. 52% uh, of the breaches focused on hacking, um, and that means individuals. 28% uh, involved malware, things like ransomware. 33% uh, included social attacks. And by the way, phishing falls into that category. So big, significant, uh, a lot of activity that even uh, we at Extreme have experienced uh, in the 2019 timeframe. And that, that's one of the reasons why we now ourselves uh, institute internal phishing campaigns to provide better awareness. Um, you can look at the breach victims, uh, healthcare, obviously, uh, small businesses are obviously a very big target, uh, public sector, and then also financial. I would like to add uh, a couple updates as we start to move forward here. But if we look at 2019 in a whole, it was about 34.3 million uh, IoT attacks in 2019, which means IoT is an easy target. Uh, and we want to talk about that. Now, we'll be having a, a follow-on session uh, next week talking about IoT security specifically. I will touch on IoT with ransomware, and you may find that to be surprising, but there's been a strange marriage that has been occurring. Uh, do notice the note on uh, Texas, 22 cities and towns. Uh, hackers demand millions in payment. Uh, I don't believe that payment was made. I believe they were able to restitute because they were able to pull out our archives. Take note a couple other things here is that three minutes to hack an IoT device, and yet it takes over six months to discover any breaches. So these are bad numbers. We do have to get a handle on them. Um, this is just a quick note by Verizon that there's no industry that's too large or too small to fall victim. So we really have to start paying attention to this. And you can also see that there are no particular verticals that are uh, quote unquote targeted. Um, many of these are cyber criminals and they will, they will basically go anywhere where they feel they could get money. Now, obviously when you're talking political advanced persistent threats, things of that nature, uh, things tend to be more targeted, but uh, quite frankly, that, that tends to be, you know, the minority things and tends to be in the nation state arena, if you will, against the public sector. Uh, now, as we look at 2019, let's take a look at what ransomware is. Uh, first of all, it is malware code. And due to its prevalence in the industry and the significant impact that it can have, it has gained a somewhat mythological or legendary status. But it's not some miasma or some type of vampire that creeps under your door at night. This is malware code. It can be identified. It can be tracked. It can be eradicated. And there are ways to, uh, to prevent it from infiltrating and infecting systems. So it, 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 there are answers to this. It's not something that we are just, quote, unquote, unable to deal with. But do look at the annual ransomware damage from 2015 to 2021. And we have a longer timeline. We'll talk about the evolution. Now, the whole theory here is that the victim is held for ransom uh, with a threat of code deletion or distribution. Uh, their files are usually encrypted, and unless you pay the ransom, we're going to take your, your data and put it on, on a dark web, unencrypted. Um, and that's usually the threat. However, sometimes, particularly nation states, will use denial of service strategies, things of that nature. Uh, for instance, disabling public utilities, disabling power grids, things of that nature, uh, to make political statements, um, to try to get nations to be coerced to, to basically bend a certain way versus another. Um, these attacks are usually very fast, and they're intended to be fast because they want to push the victim into a paying position as soon as possible. You don't want to give time. And the typical form of payment is in cryptocurrency, and that, that in itself has an interesting history. And in order to understand that and the trends around this evolution, we need to look at a different timeline. So this is a look at ransomware from one of its first iterations. I'm not sure this is the actual first one, but it's, it's one of them, PC Cyborg, 1989, folks. Um, back then, 
basically the way ransom was paid is they went out, they put it in a locker in a bus station or a dumpster somewhere and the ransom was paid in the old fashioned way. Um, and quite frankly, that uh, was a very difficult thing and it made ransomware a difficult thing to accomplish. Networking connectivity and vulnerable devices uh, typically were not there. And ironically, we had no security protections, but networking just simply wasn't dense enough. And by the way, I was in the business in 1989. I remember what it was. Uh, you know, the internet didn't exist as we know it today. Web didn't exist. So all of this stuff really kind of added and built on a foundation. Uh, in the two, the box in the middle kind of talks about two notable pieces here. Uh, first of all, the Android release, and then shortly before that, the uh, first iOS uh, Apple phone, uh, iPhone, uh, the coordination and launch of Bitcoin, which is obviously cryptocurrency, and then underneath the rise of the dark web. Basically, what we see is uh, an increase in BYOD and IoT, which are very, very vulnerable attack vectors, and then also uh, a method of evolution to get the ransom paid in a very, very quiet, dark fashion uh, that's very, very difficult to trace. And as you can see, the density of the uh, types of ransomware have increased. Now, I want to emphasize that this is a very, very limited list. It is only to show a trend of increased density. Towards the end, on the right-hand side of the slide, if I were going to list everything that we were seeing uh, since 2015, for instance, I would literally run out of space on the slide. Um, obviously, the big one that we all remember is WannaCry, uh, and really uh, variants of that are evolving very quickly, and we'll talk about that evolution because it's important. But note the increase in the trends and the, the complementary aspect. This is the point that we have to realize is the cyber attackers, they're actually leveraging on these three vectors. Now, traditionally, when we think about ransomware, uh, you know, we have a, a user and he falls victim to a phishing attempt. Uh, so there's an email with a malicious attachment uh, and then there's a ransomware payload. Uh, there's encryption, uh, creation of uh, command and control infrastructure, uh, and then uh, the files are encrypted, the data is inaccessible, and they get their pop-up. Uh, that, that's what most people think of. Uh, there's a gym that I go to, and the owner of the gym, that's the way he experienced his attack, and we actually helped eradicate him. Uh, but water holding is a little different, and sometimes these can work in fashion, because notice the secondary thing a phishing campaign can do is it can give you a link. That is very common in the COVID crisis. Uh, people are getting uh, SMS texts. Uh, they are getting emails uh, saying, hey, you know, in the United States, there's, there was a government stimulus program, which meant that people were getting money from the government and people were sending emails saying, hey, click on this link and find out about your check. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, so that was very, very popular here. Uh, and it was actually tracked and, and noted by the FBI. Uh, by the way, I am a member of InfoGuard, so I work clo quite closely with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Now, in this type of instance, they have to have some sort of malicious infrastructure. Obviously, there's a web server, uh, and it, it's typically uh, something that would uh, deliver the ransomware payload. But notice in both of these instances, I have to get the human to do something. So here, education can help. Education can help quite a bit here. Paying attention to phishing campaigns, running little artificial phishing campaigns to see who trips up. Uh, we were sending out one about you know, a shipment that you were expecting and reach out to Amazon, find out about your package. We had about 13% of the people uh, that were sampled click on that email. So, you know, these things, and these probably were people that just happened to be ordering from Amazon at the time. So these are good exercises to do, and education can go a long way towards helping you out in getting a handle on this situation. But there is another factor that we need to pay attention to, uh, and that is IoT. And the theory here is you infect one, spread to the many, and you use IoT to do it. Now, if you think about it, if I can infect an IoT device, which many times underneath is nothing more than a, a slim Linux system, and I can compromise it and get malware code onto it, then I get an ingress into the enterprise, and I have a method of propagation, and I don't have to have a human do anything. 
okay? So we really need to be concerned because this is actually starting to happen. And by the way, I'm using Mariah as an example here, but it's not the only IoT botnet that you should be worried about. They're out propagating and proliferating. Uh, Cozy Bear uh, has created two or three uh, intelligent botnets uh, that can run inside the network and they're very, very targeted in the public sector. Um, and we believe around our elections as well. Got to remember, November's coming up. Uh, a new and improved Mirai. This is something we're seeing in the industry. Nation states, we suspect, are starting to enter the picture. 11 new exploits have been added uh, to the Mirai botnet, bringing the total to 27. And yes, ransomware payloads are among them. Uh, and if you take a note by Unit 42 in Palo Alto, uh, again, this reflects my comment earlier, we're going to see more and more of these botnets, and they're going to get smarter. Uh, and they're going to be able to do things other than just uh, credential brute force in the future. Um, there are new credentials added, uh, and scarily, uh, there is an extension of the target list. So they're starting to look at infrastructure systems, enterprise systems, uh, super sign, digital signage, things of that nature. So what do we expect in 2020? Well, uh, obviously um, things have changed quite a bit and I was going to add some COVID slides in here, but uh, we're doing a COVID specific seminar uh, in just a week or two calling Returning Back to Normal and Extreme Networks will be hosting that. Um, I will make sure Goran gets a copy so that you guys can, uh, you guys can join if you see fit. Um, but what we expect in 2020 is really more of the same. Uh, number of mobile users uh, are continuing to climb. Uh, many mobile users have multiple mobile devices. Uh, I am one of those. I have two. I have a tablet and I have a phone. Uh, I think I'm pretty standard, but many people have an iPhone and an Android and a tablet and a Chromebook. So that's actually one of my colleagues. Uh, the, as a result, the number we're generating per day, data generated per day is 463 exabyte. That's a, that's a hard number to get your hands around, but actually that, that's more information than mankind has created up until modern era. Uh, and we're generating that every day. That's actually a, a profound thing when you think about it. And then the number of uh, uh, people uh, and devices is starting to change. It used to be a relatively close ratio, but now we're starting to see, particularly with the advent of BYOD and IoT, 10 times as many devices as people in the world. Um, and guys, uh, if, if these are not properly secured, they become a very valid target. 5G. We're seeing that, uh, and uh, agricultural, industrial IoT, autonomous vehicles, smart cities, connected healthcare. Uh, 5G is a big arena, uh, and it has a lot of promise, uh, but if you've been reading the articles, there are security vulnerabilities that have been discovered in subsystems, so we do need to get a handle on that, and we do need to treat that in a zero trust fashion as well. Now, when you get out to 5G and things like agriculture and industrial IoT, zero trust becomes a, a bit more challenging. Uh, but I would uh, still posit, along with Goren, uh, that it's not impossible. These are all tractable concepts, and we can do that. The other advent is smart cities. When we start to look at tying our critical infrastructures into networking, and we start realizing the benefits of intelligent power grids, intelligent water distribution, intelligent transportation, we also have to realize that unless we secure the technologies that are being used, we are only increasing the vulnerability and the breadth of our attack surface. Now, much of this is fueled by the cloud, uh, mass migration of business systems into the cloud. Um, Extreme is very big in cloud. We use cloud, we provide cloud networking. Uh, and we have to realize again, that if, if this is not done properly, it creates an increased attack surface and emerging vulnerabilities. And if you don't think that you can have ransomware come into you through the cloud, then you need to learn again, because that has been known to happen as well. If you have a vulnerable web system on the cloud that's able to compromise, it can reach itself back into the enterprise. There's been a lot about AI and ML. Um, I'm, 
I'm a day day analyst. Uh, that's one of the things I do. And I think I don't think AI really truly exists, not in the general factor AI that we talk about. In other words, the ability for a computer to literally act like a human. I believe all forms of AI that exist now are fairly normal uh, or fairly narrow, excuse me. Um, and these are basically trained type systems. Uh, but do realize that uh, they are evolving rapidly. And they're both the solution and the problem because is, you know, we're using AI and we're actually using AI for security with an extreme. However, you have to realize that, uh, that there are emerging vulnerabilities. If I can compromise the AI, uh, and it was a great example of an intelligent flood distribution system at uh, DEF CON. Uh, and there was a young German gentleman uh, who had done the research and had actually, you know, production PLCs, production PLCs that control the, the floodgates on the dam. And he was actually able to go in and start to compromise the loop so that the, the sensors were providing incorrect water levels back to the PLCs. Obviously, the dam gates opened and uh, flooded the environment. It was just an aquarium type thing, but it was, it was actually a, a pretty good demonstration because he was using real world equipment and he showed how he was able to dupe the system. So we have to realize that as we make things smarter and more intelligent, there are emerging vulnerabilities if we don't think about the communication patterns and the authentication of those patterns and uh, again, the, the integrity of those patterns. Uh, keep in mind that, you know, the, the AIC triangle of security, it, it remains the same whether we're talking next generation AI or we're just talking normal IT security. Also realize that it's both the solution and the problem because the attackers are starting to use AI as well. They are starting to use ML and they are starting to use it to be leveraged against us. So we do need to pay attention to the fact that this is also the solution and also can be part of the problem. Now, RSA Conference 2020, we had a fairly big presence there. Um, here are the top 10. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I do want you to take a moment to read them. Uh, keep in mind that the human element was at the top. I find it curious that the human element is at the top and yet anything having to do with humans is at the bottom. So take note of that, that's rather odd. We put the human element up on top and yet down below, number eight is security awareness and training. Number nine is communication and number 10 is professional workforce and development. To me, that demonstrates that people don't have their, their order straight. Um, if number one element is important, then obviously security awareness, communication, professional workforce development has to go higher in this scale. But notice how many people just back up to the technology. Uh, now, I'm not gonna say any of these things aren't important. For instance, you know, secure engineering processes, that's what I do internally. But keep in mind that you know, this has to be really taken holistically. So I would urge you not to look at this in a prioritized fashion. I would just urge you to look at this as a bulletized set of pieces and trends that we need to pay attention to. You can explore trends, and by the way, all of this in the trend report is available uh, at the RSAC site. So let's talk about managing the risk, because this is important. And if we don't get a handle on that, then, then really it becomes very, very difficult. You may remember this icon from the last time. It really is fairly cons uh, uh, consistent. Get the basics right, enforce proper security practice, leverage industry resources, and continued diligence. Vigilance. Get the basics right. Educute, education, education, education. Have offline backups. Remember, if your backups are online, they are just as prone to attack as your frontline data stores you have to make sure they are offline backups. So mirrored stores, continuous data protection, anything like that uh, is, is not sufficient. You have to have complete offline backups that you can basically be able to rehydrate. And obviously, depending on the criticality of the assets involved, those backups need to be fairly dense. Sometimes they might even need to be as order of 15 minutes. Now, people make question how that, but talk to your storage vendor. You know, there's NetMap, there's Tivoli or NMAP or 
uh, I forget. I used to be in the business. I forget all the vendors' names. But anyways, talk to your storage vendor. Many of them have ransomware protection mechanisms so that you can snap and separate the data store and get those volumes offline. Patch management, very, very key. Um, I do want to take a note that one of our uh, competitors uh, received a major, major breach uh, within their data center. And I'm not going to mention the vendor's name. Uh, if you kind of look into the uh, look into the press, you'll find it. But uh, basically, it was because they had open sourced unpatched servers within their data center, which is is really kind of hard to believe. Enforce proper security practices. I'm not going to go through all of these. We went through these in the past seminar, um, and you can look at that recording because we go through detail in each of these. And then finally, network segmentation. And this is one of the reasons why I asked that question about IoT and IT isolation. I'm very, very happy to see that 65% of our attendees are actually doing segmentation to IoT. I wanna urge the other percentage, please, please, look at how you can get this stuff segmented, create tiered environments, because remember, this can slow or prevent the propagation of malware, whether ransomware or otherwise. If an IoT device does get compromised and it's properly segmented, then it becomes much more difficult. And if it's actually isolated, then it becomes almost impossible for it to propagate into your user community. Yes, your IoT devices can be infected and propagate, but that's a lot easier to eradicate than major database compromises and things of that nature. Enforce proper security practices. We will revisit this. I'm not gonna go through this in a lot of detail, but really three categories. Get a handle on what's in your network, do the proper segmentation, and then watch them. Do traffic analysis, anomaly detection. Now, next week I'll be talking very specifically about this because we've done a lot of research in this at Extreme. Uh, and the reason why is we have a lot of manufacturing, we have a lot of state and local governments that utilize our technology and, uh, and IoT is obviously a big piece of what they need to deliver. Um, I do want to note security profiles based on whitelists. Take note of what Goran said at the beginning of the session. Enforce proper security policy practices in cloud. Uh, many people, they start popping stuff up into the cloud and they haven't done any proper compliance. Uh, you have to do classification of data, you have to have tracking, uh, you have to be able to do audits, uh, and you have to do this regardless of the, whether it's a public, private, or hybrid environment. Uh, keep in mind that uh, business continuity and disaster recovery plans can be uh, used in the cloud, but again, I wanna emphasize that uh, be sure to have copies that are completely offline. No continuous data protection or mirroring going on because uh, obviously that's a channel for propagation and uh, your data stores will be compromised. That actually happened to Texas. Um, and by the way, I do want to note that, uh, and I was supposed to say that earlier, uh, Honda uh, automotive manufacturing uh, earlier this week was taken down, totally disabled, their enterprise is out of commission, quote unquote. Not only the automotive manufacturing plants, but the car dealerships. And that includes not only Japan, but North America as well. So it is a true, true major impact for Honda as an enterprise and corporation. I, don't know what the financial impact will be for that, but it's gotta be staggering. Okay, uh, we're kind of a little bit over time, so I'm gonna try to, try to move along a little quicker here. Leverage security resources, uh, CIS security controls, Cloud Security Alliance, the MITRE Defense Framework. I give you the URLs, and by the way, we'll have a handout for this. Do utilize these, these are very good open system standards. And then finally, continued vigilance. Learn the things to look for out there. Uh, don't wait when you see anomalies. When you see end systems or devices acting unusual with unusual patterns, react, investigate, because early detection can prevent propagation, particularly with IoT. Anomalies are very, very easy to see, and I'll talk about that in our next session. 15 indicators of compromise. I'm not going to go through this list. This will be a handout. It is also in the ebook that we gave out in the last session. These are very good things to be using against in, in combination with MITRE ATT&CK. Uh, DNS vulnerabilities, I'm not gonna go through this either, uh, but do realize that we need to knock down DNS. DNS is becoming increasingly a point of infiltration into enterprises. If I could poison your DNS, then it basically solved the puzzle. Remember that we have 
a proven set of network security solutions. So this is the one slide that I have that's salesy. Uh, we do endpoint security, segmentation and isolation, cloud security, wireless intrusion protection, compliance, making sure that you are compliant, GDPR, HIPAA, so forth, so on. IoT security, we'll talk a lot about that in the next session. And then finally, AI and ML assisted security, to actually use AI and ML to assist and provide actionable insights to the security operations staff. So as a wrap up, we can expect more in 2020. Uh, IoT, cloud, and AI ML are new attack vectors for us. We need to start paying attention to those. Keep in mind, no one is immune. So please, if you have questions, please feel free to reach out to Extreme Networks for more information. Okay, I guess that brings us to the end, Goran. I'm sorry that I, I went a little over, but, uh, but I think it was uh, information that needed to be said. <laughs> yeah, the ones who know you knows that you have a lot of things to say, and uh, we all are aware that it's dangerous to invite you to a half an hour presentation. That's hard for you to hold. <laughs> but, it's, but it's a good presentation, Ed. It's really objective, non-productive, uh, um, product-oriented, so that's really, really good. Uh, just, just generic and basic. One thing that pops on my mind when it comes to the topic of ransomware, because when you talk about security, if when you come to GRC, government risk and compliance, when you come to CII, confidentiality, integrity, availability, if you talk about an IT department, IT department has existed for more than 30 years. What's the role of an IT department? Well, it's to keep the IT up and running from an availability perspective. Ransomware is known to be affecting the availability of systems. So for me, I claim that ransomware, for people that don't look at ransomware as a security incident, a security breach, but an availability breach. Yes. What, what, what you talk about and what I want people to understand is that this is really a security thing and not only a, an availability thing. We need to have Absolutely. more attention to it. People need to understand that this is part of the security perspective, not only the availability perspective. And I think that's why a lot of people fail on this topic of ransomware. It is. It is. I think uh, in Koran, it's interesting to say that uh, in 40% of the cases, and by the way, this is uh, actually after FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation, investigations within brand, you know, breaches in the U.S. and ransomware events. On the dark web, even after they paid. These are criminals. You can't trust them. They're not, they're not, they're not there for your good. And, and that's the best part about it. Now, here's another thing. The FBI told me about this as well. It was uh, getting to the holidays, and uh, they were coming up, and, uh, uh, and uh, they sent out this email to anyone who was compromised with this, this certain type of ransomware that, over, you know, because of the holidays, we're going to give you 50% off. And if you, if you pay the ransom now, you know, we're yeah. going to take half off. Oh, how nice of them for the holidays, you know, around yeah, Christmas. Yeah, yeah. It's like, exactly. that's crazy. That's crazy. This is a major, major vulnerability, folks. And it takes okay. companies out. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look and see what happens with Honda. But I, I, I can make a prediction that uh, it's gonna, they're going to struggle for quite a while from yeah. this event. Yeah. We have to wrap it up uh, as we try to be on time. Uh, just a quick wrap up from our side. We just have to inform all the attendees here that uh, this presentation is recorded. We will share it in an email tomorrow. Uh, as Ed told, uh, this presentation is also available as a handout that Ed has given us that will also be part of the follow up email tomorrow. Uh, Ed is back in a week together with us to present in, in a new webinar next Wednesday about uh, IoT security. I think he has, uh, has already mentioned. Uh, some of you have already registered for that, but for the others, please check it out. Could be a very, very good webinar. Tomorrow we have another webinar where we are talking about how, especially the public sector should write an RFP to map towards the NSM's uh, Green Principle um, to make a relevant and good RFP request. We'll, we'll do that tomorrow at one o'clock. So please check out our websites to see information about that and register if you have time and interest. And for our previous uh, webinars, they're also recorded and shared on our web websites under the activities section. Um, 
the last one is questions. I haven't got any questions uh, in Zoom here, so I assume that's uh, it for today. It times out, and um, we'll see you next week, Ed. Thank you very much, folks. Pleasure. Thank you very much, Ed. Bye-bye now. Talk to you next week. Bye-bye.